This video is meant to be the second part of um, the discussion on Mendelian inheritance. The first, uh, just Mendel, his experiments, and the type of inheritance uh, that uh, was observed. And then secondly, this video, more applications of it, molecular aspects and explanations of it. Um, and so the first uh, part was meant to be more than an overview that one would, you know, obtain, say, in a general biology um, uh, course, you know, say, in Bio 101, and this now a follow-up more typical of, say, a genetics uh, lecture. Uh, so the terms dominant and recessive are used, uh, but these have to result then from um, experimental observations. So for example, if the wild type condition for flies, the normal condition is to have brick red eyes in the species Drosophila melanogaster. Different species of flies have different wild type conditions. But in this species, uh, the brick red eye is the wild type condition. Here's a mutation which has a browner eye known as sepia. Is it dominant or is it recessive? Well, we don't know. All right, and if you were to discover a new mutation, you don't know. And then what you would want to do is to take a fly which was homozygous for the mutation um, in a true breeding strain and mate it with a fly which is homozygous for the wild type condition with brick red eyes. If you were to notice that all of the flies then have uh, the brown eyes, then that would indicate that sepia was dominant. So we don't know at first which is dominant or which is recessive. This only comes from um, uh, from our observation. And here, the F1 generation, the heterozygotes all have the sepia uh, mutation, uh, mutation and phenotype. So therefore, sepia would be dominant. If you then take this F1, uh, which has heterozygotes, and then you uh, mate them to uh, each other, if you were uh, to notice then that three quarters of the flies were sepia and one quarter was wild type with the brick red eyes, then you would say, oh, that's consistent with sepia being a dominant um, a mutation. And so you don't know when you begin to work with a mutation whether it is dominant or recessive. You have to observe. If you had gotten different results, so if the F1 generation had, had the brick red eyes, and this is what actually occurs, you would say that the wild type is dominant. If you were then to mate two uh, of the F1 heterozygotes, and then uh, you observe that three quarters of the offspring uh, were uh, were uh, wild type with the brick red eyes and one quarter was sepia. Once again, this is consistent with sepia being a homozygous uh, recessive uh, trait. And so uh, one doesn't simply know uh, that a mutation is dominant uh, or uh, recessive. Uh, this comes from observing uh, the uh, the heterozygotes. Um, once again, if you had a mutation uh, of wingless flies, uh, is that dominant or recessive? You don't know. So you would need to get a homozygous fly uh, for the wingless condition and a homozygous fly for the wing condition. They would be from true breeding populations. If they uh, were then mated to each other and you notice that the flies lacked wings, then you would say, oh, then clearly the wingless condition, that's the dominant allele, and the allele for forming wings would be the recessive alleles in this case. If you then mated the F1 to themselves and you got a three to one ratio of wingless flies to wing flies, once again, you would uh, say, oh, that's consistent with the wingless mutation being um, being dominant. If, however, um, you noticed that the F1 heterozygotes all had wings, all right, um, then you would say, oh, that's consistent with the wing condition being dominant. And if then two F1 heterozygotes with wings then produced a three to one ratio of wing flies to wingless flies, then you would say, once again, consistent with the uh, wingless uh, mutation um, being uh, recessive. So once again, uh, we don't know whether mutations are dominant or uh, recessive uh, simply um, by looking at them or, uh, or saying, oh, eye mutations would be this or you know, wing mutations would be that. And so we would have uh, to uh, uh, test that. Now, um, there is a type of test known as a test cross. 
uh, in which um, you don't know whether an individual, um, let's say in this case, the blue phenotype is dominant and the yellow phenotype is recessive. We know what this individual's um, phenotype is because the only way to have the recessive phenotype is to be homozygous recessive uh, for uh, that allele. So this individual is homozygous for the yellow allele. But you could have the blue phenotype if you were homozygous for the blue allele or if you were heterozygous, you know, being having a dominant allele, that means that in a heterozygote, only the dominant phenotype would be displayed. So what is this person's genotype? Well, this matters if we're talking about a disease, because if we're talking about a disease, this person could pass down a disease to half their offspring if they're heterozygous, but not if they're homozygous. So even though that doesn't affect this individual, right, they will have the blue phenotype uh, regardless of whether they're homozygous dominant or heterozygous, it would potentially affect, you know, uh, the traits their children could have. And that is, you know, often of uh, concern. Uh, and so, uh, if one then observed their children, um, then one would say uh, all of the children get a recessive allele from their father. And if it's a sizable family and they um, uh, all of the individuals have a, uh, a dominant allele uh, from this parent, uh, giving them the dominant trait, then one would say, oh, this individual is homozygous dominant. Now, in flies, this is easy because a female fly may lay 300 eggs. And so um, if you observed all of the offspring having a dominant uh, phenotype, then one could safely conclude then she uh, is homozygous dominant. In humans, it's harder um, simply because um, with smaller families, uh, at what point can you be sure that, uh, you know, this individual is homozygous uh, a dominant? Um, well, once again, you'd hate to say, I am sure, because, you know, there are families that have four children and all four are daughters or all four are sons. We know that the odds of, you know, uh, gender uh, is about half and half. Um, but, you know, you can have, even uh, though the odds are half and half, uh, uh, all uh, boys or all girls. And so one would not say, you know, I'm definitely certain now, but this is certainly consistent uh, with this individual uh, being uh, homozygous dominant. And the more children that they had, um, the, the more certain you would be on that. If, however, you observed uh, the, uh, their offspring and you found that roughly half were uh, of the recessive phenotype, then you would realize that this individual with the dominant phenotype would have to be a heterozygote because the only way that their children can have the recessive trait is to receive a recessive allele from the father, which is the only allele that he can give, but then a recessive allele from uh, the mother. So she must obviously be a uh, heterozygous. Um, so that is uh, what is known as a test cross. What makes uh, a trait uh, dominant or recessive? Well, in a genetics class, um, this is a little awkward to discuss simply because I, I think it's just typical that one part of the course deals more with um, you know, inheritance and you can observe the phenotype and then a different part of the course then uh, takes a more molecular approach. Um, but the answer is a molecular one. And so I am going to try to answer it molecularly. Uh, but once again, this may be, uh, you know, an aspect of the genetics course, which comes uh, later. So if you're asking why would a mutation be uh, dominant or recessive, one has to ask, well, what is the gene encoding? So notice here we have an individual's homozygous for one allele. Let's say that's the normal allele, the wild type allele. So they make the enzyme. So they make this much enzyme. And then this much enzyme makes this much product. Here we have two heterozygotes. 
One of their alleles is the wild type allele making functional uh, enzyme. The other allele is a mutant allele. Let's say that that doesn't work. What is their phenotype? Well, enzymes, if you look at how many react and uh, reactions are occurring and how many product molecules are being produced. Very often, a little enzyme goes a long way. And so even though these two individuals are only making half of the normal amount of uh, an enzyme, nevertheless, that half might be sufficient then for normal phenotype. I'm going to go through a few examples of this in just a second. Um, and so this would then be an example, uh, and enzymes are a good, uh, example of this, of when a mutation would be called recessive. The only person who would then have the recessive phenotype is the one who makes no enzyme. Because if you make no enzyme, then you're not getting any of that product, and that gives you a different phenotype. Making half the normal amount of enzyme, it turns out in this example, is enough for the normal phenotype because a little enzyme goes a long way. So mutations in enzymes are often recessive. There is then the possibility for mutations to be dominant. Um, in those scenarios, uh, then having half of uh, the mutant uh, gene uh, is enough to give you the mutant phenotype, as you will see in a, a uh, a coming uh, example um, with Alzheimer's, some mutant phenotypes form um, uh, uh, proteins which can't be broken down, and their accumulation then uh, then contribute to uh, dementia. Uh, if you are homozygous, then you're building up proteins which can't be broken down, which would contribute to dementia. Right, but even if you're a heterozygote, uh, half of your uh, protein is normal, all right, and so therefore uh, it can be broken down and not contributing to dementia, um, but you still are building up this abnormal uh, uh, protein which would contribute to dementia. So in this case, we would say that the mutation was dominant because this individual who is homozygous for the mutation would be building up the abnormal proteins which would be causing dementia. These two individuals, half of their protein is normal that can be broken down. But the problem is they are building up abnormal proteins. So even though only one of their two alleles is mutant, it turns out that the mutant alleles are causing the accumulation of something which is toxic. And so therefore, um, this will then give them the same phenotype of dementia as someone who has two mutant alleles. Um, the wild type allele, the normal allele, would therefore be recessive because these individuals have a wild type allele, but they're still susceptible uh, to Alzheimer's uh, or, or dementia uh, in uh, the example. And so the question is, um, the heterozygotes who have one mutant allele and one uh, wild type allele, is the wild type allele enough to give the normal phenotype? If that's the case, then we would call the mutation recessive. Is the mutant allele and uh, half of it uh, enough to give the mutant phenotype, in which case we would call the mutation dominant? All right. And so uh, if you ask why would some mutations be dominant and why would some be, would be recessive, you'd have to then investigate what actually the, um, the cells are doing. So let's give some uh, examples. So uh, there is a hormone that adipose cells uh, make known as leptin. Uh, it's a gene encoded by uh, chromosome uh, 7, on the long arm of chromosome 7. Um, and if you have a mutation where you don't make leptin, that's what's known as a leptin deficiency, that can cause a number of, of uh, problems, reproductive uh, abnormalities, immune abnormalities, but also if you're unable to uh, tell the brain that you're accumulating adipose, that makes you at, at an increased risk for weight gain. So is this mutation dominant or recessive? Well, we don't know. Um, but uh, it turns out if two heterozygotes have offspring, that the only ones who are susceptible to mutant phenotypes, such as weight gain, um, would be those who get two recessive alleles. 
This is a hormone. So these heterozygotes, they are only making, say, half the normal amount of hormone. But maybe that's enough to signal the brain that, hey, you have adipose, and you know, that then uh, causes you know, uh, an appropriate regulation of uh, metabolism. And so it's only those individuals who have no ability to send the hormone who are susceptible to the recessive phenotype. And so here's a case where a hormone, even if you're only making half the normal amount, that that still might be sufficient for normal um, and the normal phenotype. Uh, and so in this case, then the mutation would be uh, recessive. It's only the individuals who can't make any hormone who would be uh, affected. Now, hormones are signals that need receptors, all right? And so you know, a, uh, say you're teaching in a classroom. You, know, you could say, is there smoke in the hallway? You don't know unless you have a smoke detector. Is there leptin in the bloodstream? You don't know unless you have a leptin detector, a leptin receptor. And so interestingly, some people have a certain set of phenotypes like weight gain um, because they can't make the hormone leptin. Others have the exact same phenotype because they have a mutation in a different gene, the leptin receptor. So if you can't make the hormone, that then causes the mutant phenotype. If you can't perceive the hormone because you don't have the receptor, that causes the mutant phenotype. That's a different gene on a different chromosome, here on chromosome one rather than on chromosome uh, seven. But then also this would be a recessive trait because if you're making at least some of the receptor, then you can detect the presence of the hormone and respond appropriately. It's only those individuals who are homozygous for the mutant allele that makes no functional receptor that then would be susceptible uh, uh, to uh, the effects of the recessive phenotype. So this then uh, is an interesting example that genes work with other genes. So hormones need receptors. And so that you can then see mutations in the hormones or mutations in the receptor genes uh, causing similar phenotypes. And these are both examples of uh, recessive uh, conditions. Um, later in uh, my courses, I introduce, you know, many other uh, traits such as uh, you know, those which would affect, say, dopamine, which is important in the brain. It's important as a, uh, a signal, and there are uh, uh, mutations uh, which then affect uh, behaviors and drives. Um, some of these would then be enzymes. So you have to make dopamine. If dopamine is a signal, you have to make it. And so there is an enzyme known as tyrosine hydroxylase, which makes the signal. It's encoded on chromosome uh, 11. So those individuals uh, who have a mutation which is non-functional, do they make dopamine? Well, it turns out that uh, homozygous individuals would, but so too would heterozygotes. That a heterozygote who has half of the normal amount of uh, the enzyme which makes dopamine, nevertheless would make dopamine. And once again, enzymes very often have a condition where a little goes a long way. And thus individuals uh, would have the normal phenotype whereas the individuals who have recessive alleles, they can't make any dopamine. They would be the only ones to have the recessive phenotype. So if being able to make half the normal amount of dopamine is sufficient for the normal phenotype, then heterozygotes would have uh, the normal phenotype and the wild type allele would be called dominant and the, um, recessive, and, and the mutant allele would be called recessive. And we could then see uh, similar things where once dopamine is made, it has to be perceived at receptors. And then there uh, is then reuptake of uh, dopamine to repackage here. And so if you don't have dopamine, then that might cause the mutant phenotype. So some people might have behavioral effects because they can't make dopamine. Other people might have uh, mutation, uh, effects of mutations because they can't uh, uh, uptake it once again. And so the dopamine transporter is another example of a recessive uh, mutation. These heterozygotes, um, if they're making 
half of the normal amount of uh, the dopamine transporter. They can uh, uptake enough dopamine to get the normal, um, uh, the normal uh, condition. Uh, one more example of a, a recessive uh, disorder. Uh, this is a tragic disorder known as Tay-Sachs disorder, uh, which affects um, uh, uh, children and uh, causes uh, then the toxic uh, buildup of sphingolipids. If, you ha if an individual has two normal alleles, then they make the enzymes which break down these uh, toxic uh, byproducts. They don't accumulate, and so then there isn't the neuronal death. However, if you have two mutant alleles, then these sphingolipids uh, build up to the point where brain cells die. And this will cause uh, you know, a, a number of problems, including uh, then uh, the death of an individual. Um, uh, but then the question uh, here is, what uh, is the condition of heterozygotes? Heterozygotes only have one functional allele. But it makes an enzyme, but once again, enzymes can go a long way. Enzymes can catalyze a lot of uh, reaction. And so then it turns out that if that enzyme um, can perform enough reactions um, uh, and, uh, to prevent the buildup of those toxic, toxic sphingolipids, Tay-Sachs disease, therefore, is a recessive disorder. Because even if you're only making half the normal amount of enzyme, a little enzyme goes a long way. That is enough for the normal phenotype. And so a lot of, um, uh, of the genetic disorders we talk about, and certainly many of the first genetic disorders, involve enzymes. Uh, some of the earliest uh, genetic disorders were, which were applied to humans uh, were known as inborn errors of metabolism. So uh, Mendel you know, did his experiments in uh, the mid-1800s. His work was rediscovered in the early 1900s. And then the question was, you know, this applies to pea plants. Does it apply to humans? And so people uh, looked at, oh, here are these inborn errors of metabolism, which we now know as, you know, enzyme disorders, where um, these are recessive and follow Mendel's uh, pattern of inheritance. So it was realized, wow, Mendel not only discovered something in pea plants, he discovered a pattern of inheritance which applies to human disease as well. And once again, these uh, inborn errors of metabolism, like fetal ketonuria, they uh, involve enzymes. A little enzyme goes a long way. So a heterozygote, even though they're only making half the normal amount of enzyme, that's enough for the the normal phenotype. So this carrier can pass the disease on to their child, but they don't themselves have the disease. The only individuals who would then develop phenylketonuria, uh, building up toxic byproducts um, if uh, phenylalanine is in their diet, um, are those which receive two recessive alleles, which prevent them from making the enzyme, um, uh, which uh, breaks down uh, the amino acid phenylalanine. Right. So these are examples of recessive uh, uh, disorders. Before I get to Alzheimer's, uh, once again, uh, very often there are metabolic pathways which involve multiple genes. And so you might observe that there are multiple genes which contribute to a trait. So some individuals who, uh, for example, had microcephaly, um, some might have a mutation in one gene on chromosome eight, some might have another uh, mutation on chromosome uh, one. Um, but if one of the mutations uh, was uh, a recessive uh, mutation, then they might find that uh, the mutation in the other gene is as well, uh, because in that pathway, uh, heterozygotes having some of the normal uh, condition uh, some of the normal protein would be sufficient for the normal uh, phenotype. Um, getting to Alzheimer's uh, disease, um, this is an example of a dominant uh, disorder um, because there is a protein which is made. Um, it's known as the amyloid precursor protein. And if it is cleaved um, by uh, an enzyme, alpha secretase, um, it uh, then is broken down um, and uh, you don't get uh, accumulations of this toxic uh, protein um, 
uh, uh, buildup. However, if instead of making uh, the enzyme alpha secretase, if you're making um, beta secretase to break uh, this um, uh, down, uh, then um, uh, you're getting a fragment uh, which will uh, accumulate, uh, resulting in uh, Alzheimer's uh, disorder. All right, so uh, you can have in uh, neural tissue just these tangles of abnormal uh, proteins. All right. So uh, there are multiple genes involved uh, in this. Um, uh, so ApoE uh, and then genes such as presenilin 1 and 2. Now, here would be a more complex condition, whereas the uh, ApoE mutations uh, would um, uh, greatly increase the likelihood of Alzheimer's in the recessive condition, but that some of these then are dominant because um, in the uh, heterozygotes, uh, then uh, the mutant uh, uh, fragment uh, is uh, developing, which is uh, once again uh, resulting in uh, those, uh, those uh, tangles. So uh, there are multiple genes uh, involved as uh, known, um, but then uh, uh, mutant alleles of uh, certain of these genes cause dominant uh, mutations for the amyloid precursor protein, and then presenilin 1 and 2 uh, result in the accumulation of, um, uh, of uh, these plaques. And that is because that um, in heterozygotes, even though they have one normal allele, uh, that there would uh, then be the mutant allele, which would uh, result in some uh, mutant, uh, uh, some uh, mutant uh, uh, fragments uh, develop. So once again, if uh, someone uh, is wild type and has two of the normal alleles, then this amyloid precursor protein is broken down uh, normally into fragments which are further degraded and nothing accumulates in uh, the brain. However, mutations which result in abnormal um, uh, 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 cleavage uh, products uh, will then cause a product which slowly accumulates. This is known as a dominant mutation. Um, because uh, this then cannot be broken down further. And so then it accumulates and accumulates over time. Um, and then as uh, a result, even in heterozygotes, you would then have uh, these uh, fragments uh, causing the deterioration of a neural uh, tissue. And so here is an example of a dominant uh, mutation in which uh, the uh, heterozygotes uh, would uh, be affected. Okay. So um, a, in a dominant uh, inheritance uh, pattern, notice that if one individual is heterozygous, um, that uh, half of their offspring uh, then get a recessive uh, uh, allele for the normal phenotype and then half of their offspring get uh, the allele which will cause Alzheimer's. And um, so in this case, the heterozygotes uh, are uh, affected. Uh, we'll mention in a subsequent topic uh, that this is actually a little more complicated. I don't want to get into it just yet. The reason I'm having this individual be a heterozygote is actually because homozygous uh, individuals would actually die. Um, but uh, I'll get back uh, to that uh, later. Uh, and so uh, this is one of then the challenges. If one de uh, uh, develops Alzheimer's um, and says, I carry this you know, mutant allele causing Alzheimer's, one may have already by that uh, point uh, then passed it on to half of uh, their offspring. Now notice that this mutation on chromosome 21 for the amyloid beta uh, precursor protein um, is also uh, inherited in a dominant uh, form, just as presenilin-1 mutations on chromosome 1 are. 
So just as we saw with leptin and leptin receptors, that in a certain you know, pathway, that mutations were then likely to be um, recessive. Here we see that there are multiple uh, genes involved uh, in these amyloid uh, precursor protein uh, breakdowns. And so then uh, multiple uh, uh, different genes uh, were being inherited in the same way through a dominant form of, uh, of inheritance. Uh, then uh, evolution uh, and natural selection acts on you know, these differently. So let is, let's say that there is a certain mutation for an enzyme, which is recessive. If this is recessive, then heterozygotes are normal. They don't have, say, the disease. And so natural selection would not act against these individuals. They would live, they would, you know, uh, have uh, children, and then they could pass on the, uh, uh, the mutant allele. And so when mutations are recessive, they are likely to persist in the population because many of the individuals who have the mutation are going to live and pass on the mutations. So if a mutation is uh, a disadvantage, if it's deleterious, its frequency could decrease in a population, but in a recessive uh, gene, it would decrease more slowly. If a dominant mutation is uh, expressed from an early age, uh, then this individual is not likely to pass on the mutation if it uh, gives a disadvantage. So if I had a mutation, which then made me less likely to survive or less likely to have offspring, um, then I'm less likely to pass it to the next generation. I might die before reaching reproductive age. So selection could act against dominant mutations if they're uh, deleterious uh, more quickly. So when we look at the mutations which cause genetic disease, we often talk more about the recessive examples because they tend to persist in the population longer. Selection doesn't act against some of the carriers, the heterozygotes, because they don't have the negative uh, consequences of uh, the mutation. In contrast, selection acts against dominant mutations. These tend to decrease in frequency more quickly in the population. The examples that I just used of Alzheimer's disease, um, that was then interesting because it affected individuals not early in life before they have children, but later in life. So once again, if natural selection makes dominant mutations less likely to pass on, it is not surprising then that the examples that we have are very often things like Alzheimer's or Huntington's disease, things that affect you later in life because by the time that they're affecting you, uh, giving you a disadvantage that say natural selection might act on, you have already passed on uh, the uh, alleles uh, to uh, the next generation. So here's kind of a silly example of that. Let's imagine that in the zombie apocalypse, a zombie mutation gets passed on uh, uh, to people. How quickly will natural selection work against this zombie uh, mutation? Well, let's imagine first that the zombie mutation is dominant. If that mutation was dominant, then the children of the zombie who get the zombie mutation, then they walk abnormally and then they can go to a zombie hospital and let's say get cured, okay? Um, here are the children who were not sent to the zombie hospital because they walk normally, all right? Um, and um, in, if it's a dominant mutation, then uh, anyone who received the zombie mutation would then have this abnormal uh, gait. So these individuals, you can then be confident, didn't have this. And look at the grandchildren. They're all walking normally. So, you know, natural selection, in this case, this was, you know, yeah, taking care of individuals in a zombie hospital, um, that weeded the zombie mutation out of the population rather quickly. However, if the zombie mutation was recessive, all right, so if someone gets exposed to a zombie 
They now have the zombie mutation. They pass it on to their offspring. Um, but they walk normally. They're not taken to the zombie hospital because look, they're walking normally. But then one looks at the grandchildren, all right? Here, you know, one of them is clearly not walking uh, normally um, because the children included heterozygotes who could still pass the um, disorder down. If all of the individuals who have a zombie mutation were taken to the zombie hospital, then we could have you know, eliminated the zombie mutation from the population. But here in the recessive case, um, the uh, mutant allele is persisting in the population longer than it did in the dominant uh, case. So uh, after you know, just talking about uh, Mendel's uh, inheritance. Uh, this was just kind of going back and touching on a couple of the topics uh, to a little greater depth.